The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. He says that his word is truth and life, and if you will walk in it, I will bless you and bless others through you. James and Betty encourage the unified family of God to continue bringing him glory by serving others. We're learning the importance of loving our neighbor. We're learning the importance of compassion that leads you to risk your own life to save another life. We're learning what it is to put others first. Next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm James Robinson. Betty and I are continuing, and this is really going to be a pretty exciting and serious time. I'm going to be talking about what should we learn from this pandemic and what must, must the church learn. Really important. And th this is going to be, this is going to be a blessing to you. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to let you know that I'm going to try to help you, Betty. This, you know, you made sure when I took this picture that I didn't get you in the picture because you hadn't combed your hair and you were in your casual clothes. <laughs> but I want you to look at this. You see, this is little Heidi. This is our third dachshund. We had the first Heidi uh, for 14 years. And then we had little princess. You probably saw some pictures of that. Mm -hmm. Slick as a seal, black seal, a little princess. We had her 16 years. And we said goodbye to her basically on her 16th birthday. Now, we've had this little girl, Heidi, number two, and she's the smallest one of all. We've had her for three years. And let me tell you this. Uh, see, we are great-grandparents, 11 grandchildren and seven greats so far. Probably it'll just go on and on. Okay. And let me just tell you this. Great-grandparents are very grateful to God for grandparents <laughs> because great-grandparents can't keep up <laughs> with the same children like they did when they were just grandparents <laughs> because we, just, we can't handle it. Can't we that. love them, <laughs> but we are so thankful for grandparents. So we really are blessed. Listen, Betty and I are so blessed. When you think about it, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a father. I'm the product of a forced sexual relationship, and the doctor wouldn't abort me, and so I'm here as a miracle. And I really do believe it's a miracle of God's will and purpose through any yielded vessel. And I, I'm going to tell you something. More than I want the next breath. Please hear me. I'm not exaggerating. More than I want the next breath, I want the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I listen, I really want that. And you know what? I believe it's possible. That's part of what I'm going to talk to you about today because I'm going to be talking to you. Matter of fact, basically this week, I plan in the next program to talk to you about four years praying for and praying with a man I never wanted to meet. I not only didn't want to meet him, I didn't want to like him. I certainly didn't want to say, man, I love that person. I love that family. I'm going to talk to you about four years knowing Donald Trump. So don't miss that next program. Betty, we're going through a, a tremendous pressure situation. And I showed that picture of our little Heidi in your arms. When we call the family in the family room, which is what God led us to do, to leave huge crusade crowds, sometimes speaking up to a million people or more, speaking to 5,000, 10,000, sometimes 25 or 30,000, and doing this continuously many days a year for 25 years, and then suddenly sit down by a wife that didn't even want to leave the house. Are you glad you did and come and sit in this studio with these I wonderful am. people? I really am, you know, and I, at first I thought, oh, you've got to be mistaken, not me. You don't want me to sit there by you. But God had a better plan. You know, he said, the person that I have created in you, I just want you to be an example of that and just be yourself mm -hmm. and it'll be okay. And I could trust your heart too. Honey, you don't have any idea what a blessing. I've got a pretty good vocabulary, and I can be pretty convincing and pretty persuasive, but I can't ever tell you how beautiful you are through and through, how awesome you are, how amazing you are. You know, I talk about living amazed, and I live amazed with this woman every day. And I want to thank all of you who watch us and tell us that you really do love Betty because she teases. You take me kicking and screaming to the studio every week. She'd rather be at home 
but she knows God's used her here. And I'll tell you what, she would sit here and do nothing but be my friend praying for me because she knows how much I lean on her. Well, I want you to know that when God told us to call the family in the family room, I, I, I've really tried to, to get close to where it's not, you know, I can, I can preach. I, I'm full of the word. So I, I can get up and read the Bible. I can go verse by verse and get to expounding. Sometimes you say, well, James, why don't you do that? Well, my problem is I can preach 10 minutes on the period. <laughs> so when I start going with these phrases, I get stuck. And a lot of times I don't get to the main point, but because this whole word is written in my heart and hidden in my heart, the word carries me and it's shut up in my bones like a fire. And I do get weary of holding it in. And I just try not to just totally explode. And especially when we come in the family room like this, and it's not a big crusade crowd. It's not a big church crowd. We're sitting in the family room and I just kind of want to, I kind of want to lean in here and not like a daddy coming in and reading the Bible to all the kids and the grandkids, but maybe daddy coming in and just tell them how much he loves them. Just like Dudley Hall telling the story about the little donkey he called Dakar the donkey and how the little donkey always watched all the, the horses pulling the chariots and the oxen pulling the great loads and the camels that were so appreciated and everybody noticed him and there he was a little donkey. Maybe the best thing he does is kind of keep the owner's yard mowed down a little bit. But one day somebody came to that little donkey and we've just celebrated that season of Passover and came to that little donkey and said, our master wants you, you're needed today. And all of a sudden that little donkey saw a man sitting on his back that he had never seen. And he saw the biggest parade perhaps ever in the history of Jerusalem. And all the people had their palm branches and all the people were praising Hosanna. And he had never seen anything like that. And he watched all of them looking at him and praising. And that little donkey, as Dudley wrote the story for his little grandsons, four of them, he, that little donkey knew they weren't praising him. All the attention was on the person on his back. Betty, I feel like most Christians, I really believe the majority of them feel like I'm not important. I mean, you felt many times. You said that I didn't think I could really understand the Bible because I hadn't been to seminary and I thought it was the preachers and the teachers. And, and you, James, you had a gift. I could see it. But I didn't think God could talk to me. You were wrong, weren't you? I was. And through your help and watching you and how God would use you and speak to you, I thought, wow, he will do that through me too. He loves me like he loves you and anybody else. And if I just get in his word, he will speak to me through his word. And he has kept that promise. He says that his word is truth and light. And if you will walk in it, I will bless you and bless those, bless others through you. So he's kept his promise to me. Thank you for coming here in the family room. When I tell you that we want to pull you right up here at the table, I mean it. I sometimes say, God, don't let me get overbearing because we're in the family room. And I showed you that puppy in Betty's arms. God not only, not only wants you to come and die in the master's calling, he wants you to see the table that he wants to prepare before you in the presence of all your enemies and accusers and all the deceit and the dissension. And he wants to anoint your head with the oil of his presence and his comfort and his peace. He wants to anoint it to such an effect that it spills off on others. And he wants you to know that his goodness and his mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And he wants you to understand that his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. As I closed the program yesterday, I said to you that I want everyone to know that as much as I want the next breath, I want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, now, now please stay with me here. If you have a Bible and you'll open it to the fifth chapter of Matthew, I'm just going to call your attention to a few things here that have to do with the reason that I left the Coliseum and the stadium platforms and the big churches and came to a family room with you. In your room, wherever you are, you might be, you know, if, unless they kept the bars closed, you might be in a bar. You might be not in a hotel anymore unless that changed. We don't know when these things are going to change, but they will change. But wherever you are, just, just look at the fifth chapter of Matthew, because this is a verse that God had to show me when he said to me, you're going to sit down and you're going to be more effective sitting down than you've ever been standing in platforms. And you're going to become a servant and you'll be a servant communicator 
but your greatest effect is going to be servant because greatest in the kingdom, his kingdom is servant. And you're going to serve others, you and your wife. I didn't know we'd be serving missionaries. We never dreamed we were going to go for 30 years to the mission fields or longer, that we would leave here and, and be in the depths of poverty and in the revolution in Romania and at Chernobyl when it exploded and be there helping the people and be in Croatia when we were giving them incubators to save all the premature babies and, and be in the revolutions all over Africa and Angola in the war and Mozambique in the war and sh people shooting each other around us and being held hostage three times that I never told anybody about. We didn't know that, but we were servants. We went from seeing several hundred thousand people come to Christ a year to seeing several million people come to Christ a year as we served in undergirded ministries where the glory of God was radiant all over the third world and we put the oil in that lantern. And when I say we, that's the viewers of life today. I believe you are a holy remnant I believe that the greatness that we're going to see, the awakening of the remnant that awakens the church, to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven right here, right now through his body, I believe that much of what happens will happen because of people like you who have never looked away from the least of these, but you put God's arms around them just like I showed you Betty holding that little puppy. God wants to pull all of you up in his arms. And with this terrible pandemic, he wants us to learn some things. But when I was saying, God, are you sure you want me to sit down? Show me. And he took me to the fifth chapter. Look at this. This is the greatest sermon ever preached. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Just look at verse 1. Matthew 5, and when he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came. He did what? He sat down. Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever preached, sitting down. And he started it with 12 people. And those 12 people were still there, but there's evidence that there could have been thousands listening at the end. And they were able to hear him. I don't know whether he projected his voice, but they could always hear him. Somehow the stillness of the moment they heard the greatest sermon ever preached. And it was in this sermon. These are the things we've got to learn. He gave them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You're our Father not only in heaven, but Jesus taught he's in our life and we're in his arms. Thy kingdom come. Don't miss it. Thy kingdom come. Jesus announced it's come. The kingdom is here. The king is here. The redeemer has come to Zion. I'm here. What Isaiah said is fulfilled right here. And the kingdom is in you, not of the world, but my kingdom, God's kingdom's in you. And it's not of this world. And his kingdom has come, therefore, his will can be done. Where, Betty, is God's will to be done? Here on earth. Here on earth. Mm -hmm. Not in heaven. Mm -hmm. It's already, already done there. Mm -hmm. There's no opposition in heaven. You don't need an armor. You don't need to suit up. You don't need to go to battle. There's no enemy. He wants us to suit up and win over the enemy. He wants you to walk over the intentions of the devil and the deceiver like dust under your feet. So in this pandemic, what does he want us to learn? What does he want to work for good through this? I'll tell you some things he wants us to learn and what the church must learn. We're learning the importance of loving our neighbor. We're learning the importance of compassion that leads you to risk your own life to save another life. We're learning what it is to put others first, to put what's best first to follow wise authority, to keep an appropriate distance, even though it's costing you comfort, future security, you may think. You may say, I don't even know if we're going to have a job. I don't know if we're going to have a business. Let me tell you something you can go to the bank on. You can go to glory on. We follow God. It doesn't matter how hard we're hit. If we hold on to him and get his wisdom, he will raise us from the depths of depravity and defeat to the height of glory and victory. I am telling you that if we, the church, will show people how we love God and love our neighbor and love one another, and sometimes it's harder to love the members in the body of Christ like the members in your own immediate family. It's easier to love the neighbor next door or up the street. But if we'll really love each other, and we'll show people the power of that supernatural unity, we're going to see the blessings of God poured out on us, just like the promised land. He took his people out of Egyptian bondage to leave, lead them into a land flowing with milk and honey. He wanted them to have such blessings that he had to warn them and say, this word is not an idle word for you, it's your life. 
You've got to do what the Word says in order to be able to handle the blessings of this fruitful land because you're not going to have ugly things to worship. You're going to have magnificent, beautiful things to worship. You can be captured by all the great things around you. But if you have my greatness and you keep me first, you won't be deceived. But if you have an idol, then Paul taught this to the Corinthian church when he referenced all the Old Testament journeys of Israel. He said what happened to them happened as an example for us so that we wouldn't be drawn aside to the wrong things. He said, stay away from idols. The whole Old Testament taught the importance of that. The first commandment talks about that. Don't have any idols before him. And then Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said, what's an idol? I mean, the prophets made fun of it. Jeremiah and Isaiah said, what can it do? You have to carry the stinking thing. You can't walk. You got to carry it. It'll fall on you. That's the only way it could hurt you. But Paul clarified it. He said, here's how those idols hurt you. Once you have something between you and God, once you have an idol and your heart goes after something other than God, you're not just distracted, you're not just deceived, you're defeated by it. Then all of a sudden, you're fellowshipping and sharing with demons. And demonic thought processes begin to control your life, destroy your relationships, take away your joy and the fruitfulness and fullness God wants you to have in Christ. What we're seeing right now when we look in this pandemic situation, we're seeing the power of love. We're seeing the power of people working together. We're seeing the importance of men willing to lay down all the things we enjoy, whether it's sports or fun. The Masters Golf Tournament is my Super Bowl of the year because it's such a beautiful place and I've actually seen it. And I always look forward to it, couldn't see it this year. Betty's a real baseball fan. She not only likes the Rangers now, her sister loves the Astros, so she lives in Houston. She's liking the Astros. And you know, the Astros kind of made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. But let's don't make them a prisoner of their past. Let's move on. But here's the thing. We don't know what we're going to be able to do. Kids that wanted to finish out their high school senior year in sports, the, the Olympics, all the things people work for. Hey, we need to learn that we can do without some things that we think we can't. We need to learn to spend quality time together and love one another. We need to see the importance of these healthcare workers and these first responders and all of our military and service people and their families caring about the safety and security of others. Let's learn that. I'm gonna expand on this more in the next program. And I'm also gonna to talk to you about four years with a relationship, not only praying for but with somebody I never wanted to meet. And I'm gonna go ahead and close and say this. Mr. Trump, I said this to you and your family. I believe you actually love your neighbors more than you love yourselves because you've lost all your comfort. You've lost your lifestyle. And I've known all of you for four years. Not one time have I ever heard or seen you express any interest in your personal futures. You care about us. Father, thank you for that. Listen to me closely. I don't want you to miss the next program. I think we're gonna take a journey together as you look at God's word and you hear what it takes to build a house and a future that cannot, cannot be shaken and torn down or torn up by any storm. Don't miss the next program. Father, thank you for the time to share with these beautiful people. I believe they want your will to be done on earth. In Jesus' name. We're going to learn not to pray, get us out of here. But pray, God, we want to get you in here in the fullness of your power and glory. Let me show you one way, and I know the viewers of this program. You may be a new viewer. The viewers of life today, they don't turn away and they don't move when they get a chance to see what you're about to see. So just focus very prayerfully and hear God's heart, you can be his hands. Watch. Each day, we are bombarded with troubling headlines about different tragedies around the globe, ranging from natural disasters to the worldwide spread of disease. Buried in these headlines is a crisis that is often forgotten, the never-ending food crisis. Nearly three million children worldwide under the age of five die each year due to complications of malnutrition. 
Sub-Saharan Africa, which includes South Sudan, still leads the world in children's deaths simply because of the lack of food. We're here in this area of South Sudan and we've been going from village to village where we're working here and just hearing story from mother after mother. And they explain to us how they are basically terrified at the fact that they have no food, absolutely no food. They've lost everything as a result of the flood. I mean, they were desperate before, but now they have nothing. If you were here, you might describe this place in that knee-jerk reaction that says it's God-forsaken. It must be a God-forsaken place. I know that God loves these people. I know that God has sent us to help them because we have to express God's heart and extend His hands. They're relying on us. These mothers look at us. You can see that look of desperation in their eyes that says, please, please help me. Help me save my child's life. Well, I'm reaching out to you with that same heart of desperation. Help us to express God's heart in this place. Help us to take it from what seems God forsaken to a place that is God blessed, blessed with food provided each and every day through mission feeding to make sure that we save the lives of the precious children in this area who without our help are probably sure to die. Right there where Isak is, and we've been working for 30 years, right there where they were, Betty, they had to escape on that trip because the militias were coming to kill them. And uh, the first time I went to Sudan, Betty, you and I went with, with Franklin Graham. Mm -hmm. And Franklin Graham, Samaritan's Purse, he said, you gotta go, James, and see these Christians that are being driven out by these radical religions, and you know what kind of religion it is. It's just a terrorist, terrorist thing. The mothers were having these uh, horrible religious fanatics cut their breasts off so they couldn't nurse their children. And they were killing the men or maiming them, cutting an arm off or both arms. They were doing everything they could to weaken them and they drove them out. Now then it's still bad. And it was Franklin that took us there, but the reason he took us was not just to show a need that we would meet. And I mean, I saw children standing with Franklin that had arms were so thin, they almost looked like my fingers, they were so tiny. But he said, I want you to see some people that love Jesus like New Testament Christians. And they really did. They were just full of the glory of God. Betty, when you see that need and you know what love does to change things, what do you want our viewers to hear and do right now in behalf of those mothers and those children? Well, you know, James, we've talked about on this show about how desperate our, our nation, our world feels right now with everything we've been go going on with this virus that's been just sweeping across the world. And there's a sense of desperation there. But can you imagine the desperation of these mothers that Esau talked about? They have nowhere to turn. Here, we have people that can say, come, I will help you. Come here and get some food. Come here and get some help. Go to this hospital or that hospital, James, and you will find help. They have nowhere to turn. And unless we reach in our hearts and allow God to let us give to help them and offer hope to them, their babies are going to die. So please join with us as you always have so faithfully. Let's do it again. Let's help these precious little ones that God loves so very, very much. Well, Betty, I'm convinced our viewers won't look away, and here's what I know. Because you were willing to notice the least of these and be the answer to their need and the prayers of those mothers, we saved over 15 million lives, according to the reporting systems in the governments and countries of Africa and other third world countries. But right now, we're looking at three children, five children, 10 children. Just what those mothers are caring about right now, what Esau was talking about, could you help us save 10 children? Did you know that we can feed 10 children for the next months? I mean, continually, every day, for $100. We can feed five for 50, three for 30. Could, could you right now, even in your own pressure situation, could you say, I am gonna be an answer. I'm gonna be the miracle that those children and those families need. Would you go get your bank card and use it like a check? Dial the number that's there as a prayer line. If you want someone praying with you today, they're ready. But would you dial it today and say, I'm going to be an answer to prayer? Or would you go online and you can make the gift immediately? Any way you could give $100 to help 10, please. If you give 1000 and you may be able to. Some even are able to give more than that and they do it joyfully. 
but $1,000 to feed 100 kids. Would you just do what God leads you to do right now? We're going to say thank you and send you some blessings that will help you grow and strengthen you. But would you right now be an answer to prayer? Be the miracle they need. Please do it. Thank you. Mission feeding began with a promise to be there in times of crisis for thousands of hurting and hungry children in their time of need. Now more than ever, we need your help to save lives by feeding and caring for children across the continent of Africa. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish our supplies to reach the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Your gift of love can be the miracle answer to a desperate mother's prayer. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 that will help feed and care for three, five, or ten children for three full months. With your gift, we'll send you the Global Impact of Life Journal. This soft cover journal includes pictures from the mission field and inspiring scriptures as a reminder of your impact in giving to bless lives around the world. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Global Impact Bible. This English Standard Version presents a fascinating guide to the impact of the best-selling book of all time, filled with quotes from well-known figures, photographs, and reproductions of fine art. It highlights the many surprising ways Scripture has shaped civilization. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our commemorative bronze sculpture, A Mother's Strength. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. You know, we are going to send the Global Impact Bible uh, to those of you who help us feed 10 children. This is a phenomenal book. It's showing historically how the Bible impacted things in a significant way throughout history. You're going to love it. And it's the Word of God that's going to impact today uh, the way the world needs to be impacted, and it is. And you remember what I'm going to be talking about now in the next program. I'm going to tell you about the miracle journey, the four years already with President Trump. Let, let me share it. And let me share what you must see in the Sermon on the Mount. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for watching. So even when it looks to you and me as if the enemy is winning, God is in control. Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.